Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode with my guest, Dr. Mitra Ray, who is the CEO and co-founder of REST. Dr. Ray, how are you, my friend? What is happening in your world today? I am good. The sun has come out. It, I don't know if it's as sunny as in Denver, but uh, it's been raining a lot in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm doing good with the sun coming out. Yeah, I love it. As it does in the Pacific Northwest. For those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, I... Uh, as an adult, I really, when I, you know, started in university, I was really picturing myself as a researcher and I was thick into it, um, received my uh, PhD in, in cell biology, biochemistry, and in the neurosciences from Stanford Medical School. And I had a pretty strong career published in major scientific journals, received lots of awards, I was on a strong research career track for sure. And, but my, my own health kind of got in my way. And even though I was walking the halls with Nobel laureates, I was not getting the answers I was looking for, Michael, in those hallways. And I just thought to myself, you know, is this it? Because everyone was telling me, you're going to have to live with these excruciating back spasms that I had. And I'd lean over a microscope and make it worse. And then I'd have to go see you know, someone in physical therapy, something I couldn't afford ongoingly, I'd be on medications, I gave myself an ulcer by taking ibuprofen all too much daily. I bought it, you know, in bulk from Costco. And nobody was telling me how terrible that was and what was going on. And I, a little voice inside me said, this can't be it. I, I'm, you know, I'm just in my early 20s, uh, late 20s, and I already have an ulcer that's not right, that can't be right. And I, my father had also, you know, uh, a heart attack, and he actually died from his second heart attack. And my mom ended up with dementia. So I was watching my parents suffer. And then I started to see myself also st suffer. And I lost my father to his second heart attack just two months before I gave birth to my first child. So that was a huge loss for me. And between what was happening with my parents' health and what was happening with my own health, I made a courageous move when I was 30 years old to leave the halls of academia and research and start to do my own research and start to look for answers elsewhere. And that's when I began to learn a lot more about nutrition. I started working with a company that was, yeah, I, I, I just started a juicing regimen and this company had figured out how to put fruits and vegetables in a capsule form. And I thought that was a good idea because I was a biochemist and maybe the average person thinks, oh, you know, they maybe they didn't get the technology, especially in the late nineties, but I got it right away because I was using the same technology to dehydrate cells. So I just caught on to that. And then I started, I started getting results. My back got better just from these little capsules. And then I started to research well, what else can fruits and vegetables do? And here I was being funded by the National Institutes of Health and the American Cancer Society to study or look for cures for degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's cancer. And I realized, wow, you know, and back then we didn't understand the power of a plant-based diet as, as well as we do today, but I started to educate people. And that became my new career, sort of educating people, writing books, doing seminars, and telling about people about this product. So that I did that, you know, still doing that. And about three, four years ago, well, actually the journey probably started 15 years back a, a friend of mine who I met in graduate school, who's also a neuroscientist. She had been playing with um, something called neuroemotional psychology. And she over the years became quite famous and people would fly like the wall street journal did an article on her because she started to treat people for initially it started with hypnosis, but then it went to this neuroemotional technique, which then she kind of morphed into something called rest, which is today's form of, you know, what she created. It's called, it stands for rapid reprogramming of emotional stress technique. And when I was her Guinea pig, and when I started to use it, or she started to work with me, I 
had such amazing breakthroughs in my life that even though I kind of was kind of winding down, I thought in my life, but I decided we needed to form a company and get the word out that we could really do something very definitive and precise to help people heal their individual specific traumas that they experienced early in childhood. So that's kind of like the short version of how I ended up here. And I realized behind everything is emotional trauma. And trauma defined by an adult, you think very, you know, extreme things like a, a, a parent gets incarcerated or there's physical abuse. But the important thing to understand about childhood trauma is it's in the eye of the child. And, the ch and a child can be traumatized by the most trivial of things because they don't have a logical brain. They don't understand the world. And they could be left alone in the playground for a hot minute, or they could be taken out of their hot their, their bathtub a little too early. And all these little things can become a traumatic experience for them. And that, tra that traumatic experience kind of lives in their body and can be triggered at any time when you're not, you know, ready for it, so to speak. So I have really become an advocate that we all take a good look at our childhood if we want to heal those patterns of behavior that aren't working for us, no matter what they look like. Yeah, 100%. And, and that's an incredible back backstory and journey to where you are today. And when, when you were talking about your illnesses in your early 20s, my first thought was like, well, that sounds like stress to me. That sounds like this chaos of that environment. And like, maybe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. So excuse me if I do, but it's like knowing the where I was in my 20s, like not having coping mechanisms for being able to manage and facilitate that. You're 100% right about that. Being a first generation, short brown Indian woman at Stanford medical school with, <laughs> with a lot of men that basically took a lot of advantage of me and my ideas and a lot of, a lot of stressful things happened. It wasn't so pretty. So yeah, absolutely. The stress didn't help and I did not have co the coping mechanism. So it showed up as physical ailments for sure. Yeah. I, I faced the same thing in my, my twenties getting diagnosed with a couple of different things and just sitting there and thinking to myself, no, I don't like this. I'm, I'm not yeah. going to accept this prognosis and, and realizing that one of the especially important things that one must do in this journey is be an advocate for their own health. Because of course, doctors always have your best interest in mind. I mean, that's part of the freaking Hippocratic oath, but like at the same token, <laughs> like they're seeing 8,000 patients a week and you get eight minutes and Ultimately, I would say maybe don't spend so much time on WebMD, but also you have to be willing to go onto this journey and try these different things. You know, one of the things that that was really fascinating to me about what you do and going into rest was thinking about, and I could be wrong here, so let's go into this. Yeah. You know, the, the parallel possibly of other emotional behavioral changing. Um, the word that I want to use just went out of my brain. That's fine. Um, avenues will be the word that I use instead. Um, like EMDR, like yes. talk, talk us through the process of, of rest and, and how that plays a role in this journey of healing. Yeah. Um, well, when you look at, you brought up EMDR, there's so many things that are out there today. Um, emotional freedom technique, which is tapping, uh, known as tapping, EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapy, all these things that are out there. The one critical, they're, they're all great. And they're definitely, you know, the new, the new psychology is neuroemotional psychology to really understand that these are patterns that live in our subconscious mind, in our parahippocampus and our amygdala, and they trigger the entire body. You know, some some amazing books have been written, like The Body Keeps a Score, and also Oprah's latest book, um, What Happened to You. Really looking into childhood trauma. Amazing studies have been done. Like childhood, if you if you look at um, 
let me let me do a little bit of history. Like if if this is how important tra trauma is to understand, and and this is a study that was done by and you, I'm sure you know it between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, looking at adverse childhood experiences. Now, they defined adverse childhood experiences from the perspective of an adult, like incarceration, divorce, you know, abuse, serious things. Child children expand ex experience trauma at even in even much more trivial things. But let's just talk about this study. The study showed that if you have more than, you know, six of these early childhood experiences, then your life expectancy is reduced by 20 fold. Compare that to like smoking, which is reduces your life expectancy by tenfold. And smoking, I know, is probably the one that's known the most for reducing life expectancy. But trauma is, you know, far outweighs what smoking can do for you. So absolutely, it's important. So these newer methods like EMDR and things, they start to look at how to manage the neuronal connections that trigger those reactions. And that's a great start. These are great starts. Where rest differs is that we have a way this all began some, somewhere. When did this begin? When did this, when was the original event for each person that we can go back to? Like, let's say today you, you found a job that you finally love, or you found a career path that you finally love and everything was going well. And then, I don't know, six months into it, suddenly the rug got pulled out from underneath you and you decide to tell, and you say to yourself, this happens to me all the time. Every time something happens, cause you're now talking about a belief system that you have and you start saying, you know, every time things start to look good, the rug gets pulled out from underneath me. Why does this keep happening? And people notice these patterns in their life and they go, this always happens to me. Well, you could go to a therapist, you can do some temporary relief with tapping or EMDR and whatnot and generalize what might have happened maybe in childhood and then try to release that through you know moving your eyes and whatnot what rest does though is it pinpoints exactly with a we have a step by step <laughs> method of being able to talk literally to your subconscious mind and play like this 21 question game and figure out how old were you who was with you, what happened, and you've forgotten all about this memory. This is called an implicit memory because you, you don't remember the who, what, where, and when, but your body remembers the milieu of emotions that you experience. When we say stress, it's really a milieu of negative emotions that you're experiencing. And it's very particular and it's very nuanced. And then that pattern get, got stuck in your body. And so whenever something smells the same, feels the same, your brain is just like a look, a pattern recognition machine. And it goes, this smells and feels like what happened to you when your mom took you out of the bathtub when you weren't ready. Now, that was a trivial ex experience, really, from an adult perspective. You were in the bathtub and your mom said, it's time to get out and have dinner. But you created this whole imaginary world in your bathtub. You were four years old. You were having a good time. Life was good. And you, you knew that if your mother took you out, that would be the end of this complex imaginary world you had created in your bathtub. And then you have this emotional experience about that. You feel betrayed, you feel you know, uh, lost, you feel uh, threatened, you feel fear, you, you feel like that you're not in control of the situation. You feel all these complex things because we are first and foremost emotional beings. What adults don't realize is that even a baby in utero is emotionally highly complex. They may not be able to talk, they can't represent their thoughts, but their emotions are as complex as they will ever be because they don't have a logical filter to filter out what is actually happening in their life. So they're having this highly emotional experience. You're having this highly emotional experience getting out of the bathtub. And then next time 
something gets taken away from you before you're ready, you fire up that same emotion. Now that pattern gets stronger. And over and over again, every time something feels the same, you fire up that old pattern. And that pattern just gets stronger to the point where it's so automatic that when you lose the job in the present moment or that career path, the story that I started with, right? You think it's all about today, but it's not. It's about when you got taken out of the bathtub. And what rest does is goes back and identifies that's what happened. That's all that happened. And it's a non-threatening, non-invasive way to actually rewire your, I call it non-invasive brain surgery because you can do fMRI scans and realize that now the same issue does not trigger your brain the same way. And we, we, we cut out that original, we, we heal, we emotionally soothe and heal that original experience. You do it yourself and it's, it doesn't take a lot of work. It's just a step-by-step -step process. It's not like this huge work hard, emotionally dra draining kind of process by any means. It's simple and easy. And when you do it, at the end of it, you're like, oh, it's gone. That emotion, that emotional experience that I'm having, and it's gone for good. It's gone for good because we've soothed. And, and this is this kind of, a, I think that there was a study in the, I want to say around 2017 that was published showing that once we open up one of these implicit memories, we have about 15 to 20 minutes to reprogram it. And that's the window we take advantage. We open it up in, in a rest session, we reprogram it, and then it can never haunt you again. And that's basically what happens during a rest session. My first thought is like, there are so many places we can go in this right now. Yeah. Um, one being like, we're tapping into the matrix, which I love. So let's go into this. Early on in this show, about three and a half, almost four years ago, one of the things I talked about was the ACE study and going into the depths of it because recognizing while I don't think it's the end all be all to this conversation, I think it's a great jump off point. And, and the reason why is because understanding that research actually changed my life uh, mm -hmm. because I am in the small minority of people who have a score of 10. Yeah, and that's so the entirety of this show, which everyone who listens to the show knows the truth, started very selfishly because I was like, I need to find solutions. I'm looking at my life. It's it's imploding. I've tried every modality, the word I was looking for earlier, on trying to go through this journey. I mean, you name it, and I have done it, literally all of it. And and I came to realize, like, unless I got deep, deep, deep into understanding the research, understanding the brain, understanding neuroplasticity and psychology and reading and understanding books created by, like, Bessel van der Kolk and Pete Walker and Gabor Mate, like, I was for sure going to die within the next 10 years. That's where I thought I would end up at. And I've got a lot of comorbidity factors that I would say probably make that accurate. You know, one of the things that I, I think about quite frequently is there, I, I personally find that I have an, an, a memory like an elephant. I know a few people who do. To me, I go, oh, that's the ultimate defensive mechanism for survival. And one of the things I found very interesting is that the higher people have landed on that A survey, the better their memory is. And so it's not so nuanced as it would be for many people. And I have not studied this. I cannot prove it. This is just me going through this process of now and coaching thousands of people. What I'm curious about, and especially within rest, is understanding this brain a little bit better and going a little bit deeper into it. I'd love for you to break down these three states of the brain, because I think that if we can get into understanding what it really means when we're talking about these neural emotional states, we can create some massive context for people in the way that I needed it four years ago and 10 years ago in starting this journey. Perfect. Okay. So this was a, a concept that was first put forth by Zue Kwa. And she said, okay, she calls brain 1.0, basically the Godzilla brain. I call it the lizard brain. Other people have called it the lizard brain. It's the survival brain. It's the one that people talk about the flight or fight brain. And what happens during fight or flight and with your brain is, as I said, so these traumatic memories that I just talked about from the child's perspective, these traumatic memories get laid down in the parahippocampus. They, because the hippocampus isn't quite developed, you know, during the first five years. 
So it takes a little while for us to build the hippocampus where me autobiographical memories, where we start to remember the who, what, the, what, the why, the where, those kinds of things. But before then, we're kind of in a hypnotic state and we don't remember all those things because the hippocampus is kind of jello still. So, so we kind of lay down these emotional, purely emotional memories in the parahippocampus, which lives right near the amygdala. And when you're stressed, what happens is your heart rate variability changes. What is your heart rate variability? Well, if I say your heart rate is 70, for some people, it's beat to beat, it's 70. It's like the heart is keeping a beat. Every beat is like, you know, at the right interval. If, I, if it was keeping a rhythm, it, if it's keeping a rhythm, it's a nice, good, high heart rate variability. Now, if it's seven, it can also be 70 because you average it out over a minute, but it can be like, all over the map, like not keeping a beat, but mathematically you can average out over a minute to be 70 still. So it's not the heart rate, but the heart rate variability that tells us how in sync our body is. And the, it is the heart that rules the brain. So 90% of the information goes from the heart to the brain, not the other way around. The brain does not rule the heart. The heart rules the brain. So when our heart rate variability is high, that means we are joyful, excited, loving, appreciative, those kinds of emotions. You know, you can do meditations. The Heart Math Institute really put forth this idea of, you know, increasing your heart rate variability by regularly practicing appreciation, joy and appreciation for 15 minutes a day in the morning or maybe in the evening, just regular little intervals and you can increase your heart rate variability. But when you're stressed, what happened, the first thing that changes is your heart rate variability. It starts to go all over the map. Your heart is no longer keeping a beat. That sends a messy signal to the brain, which means like normally when, you're, when your heart is, heart rate variability is high, you're sending a smooth pattern. You have access to your prefrontal cortex. You can think logically. You can also think creatively. All these things are there. But in brain 1.0, what happens is that you get stressed, which triggers an old memory like I described, like the bathtub incident in the hippocampus and the, and the information no longer goes through the brain, but it goes straight back down the vagus nerve into the body and you have a physiological stress response. That's brain 1.0. It's a Why? fight or fight response. Does that make Why sense? Why does it skip going to the brain and directly into the body? Because the heart is telling the brain we're in danger. Right. So it's an autonomic response. So it's it's, a, exactly. It right. becomes an autom autonomic response in the body and you're in a heightened state and you think somebody's threatening you or something, your life is threatened or something is at stake. So you, you go into that survival lizard brain mode, which is the, you know, the amygdala takes over and the amygdala is, is the oldest part of the brain. That's why it's called the lizard brain. We share it with lizards, you know, so it's, it's the old part of the brain. So we go into a survival mode. And we try to take, you know, we're trying to do big things in our adult life, but we start to act like a three-year-old and we go into a flight or fight pattern. Okay. This used to be written off as like, oh, it's just because that amygdala got, you know, got uh, turned on because you feel threatened. Well, it's not simp as simple as that. You actually triggered an exact memory of an, as something that happened to you when you were a child. And that's why you're having that response, okay? Now, brain 2.0 is a little bit more evolved than when we're, brain 2.0, you know, a lot of high performers operate in brain 2.0. That's when you figured out how to activate your dopamine circuits, like how to get an award, a reward, like, you know, everything from becoming addicted to your cell phone for the likes that, get, that gives you a dopamine response to actually being productive in life and creating goals and accomplishing them gives you a dopamine response. And you can, so that is what Zui Kua calls the teenage brain, brain 2.0, that you find a carrot and you chase after it. And a lot of people do a lot of things to keep that brain 2.0 going. Like, how can I create the next reward for myself? How can I get there? How can I stay motivated? How can, et cetera, et cetera. 
So brain 2.0 is great when it's working. However, we tend to sometimes overshoot our goals or say yes to too much. And we create an environment where we're, we become overwhelmed trying to chase our own goals or something traumatic actually happens in life and boom, you get thrown back into brain 1.0. So what I see is people really oscillating in life between brain 1.0 and brain 2.0. They're going after their dreams and goals. Something happens, they get thrown back into brain 1.0. Then they regroup, go on vacation, go see a therapist, go to a lot of yoga classes. They get back into brain 2.0. And then something happens, they go back to brain 1.0, 2.0, 1.0. We just go back and forth, back and forth. And there's this like cycle. But every time there's a cycle, those stress patterns are getting stronger because they're neuronal patterns. And every time they get fired, you, we grow more, what I call my, the, 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 the neurons get stronger, basically. And then the signal travels faster and faster each time. It, does, that, does that become exponential? Um, somewhat like it's the difference between like, you know, be, the way I would hit a tennis ball versus a, a tennis pro is a tennis pro is going to respond 400 times faster than me because their neurons are so much faster. So their, their neurons are, the, the, it's kind of like a, a, an electrical cable that is highly insulated, makes the electrical signal travel all the faster. So they have very highly insulated neurons built for those neurons that fire up their hands swinging the bat, you know, the swinging the racket, right? So, so similarly, our stress patterns can get stronger with time, and with and rep repetition makes these circuits stronger and stronger and stronger, right? So, would it be fair to say that when what's called a triggering moment occurs, you find yourself in this cycle, the back and forth? Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that that becomes more intensive? The yes. more times that you fall into it, yes. thus, would it be also fair to say then it's more difficult to get out of it? Yes. Yes. That's, that's really hard. You know, that's why we have all the jokes about as you get older, it's really hard to break your patterns, you know, and we know that young people, it's easier to help them change their, their ways, so to speak, because their patterns are just stronger. Right. So we want to try to, and then, but there is this hack called rest where we can break up these patterns like that, you know, and you don't have to work so hard at it. So that's why I love it so much. And so brain 3.0 is the wise and integrated brain. And what I am realizing, not just me, myself, but the people that are working with neuroemotional psychology, and certainly with our rest clients, we are seeing, and for myself, I've seen that as you start to break down these armors we've created in life, through our childhood experiences, as we start to let go and release these patterns, survival patterns, which you can think of as like we've put armors all over our body. Every time we experience something, we try to like, you know, protect us from ever experiencing that again. As we take those layers away, a more wise and integrated and far more intuitive, naturally creative person starts to emerge. It's kind of like, you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, who am I? And, you know, you're kind of like, I didn't realize I was as smart as I am or as creative as I am. And you, and it's like, it's like, um, you can hear yourself again. You can find your clarity again because stress takes up so much energy, so much energy. And when you're not wasting that energy being this, this background stress, and it's not, it's not like big red lights. It's more like static in the background. And that static takes up a lot of energy because it's always in your brain, right? As those, as that static starts to clear up, you just receive a far more clear signal. You're much more clear about who you are, where you're trying to go, how you're feeling, you understand your, and as you do rest sessions, you begin to have compassion for yourself and what happened to you early in childhood. And you realize I'm not broken. I love the name of your podcast, by the way, Michael. I'm not broken. I just had a childhood. <laughs> That's all that happened is I had a childhood with a bunch of experiences that the adults around me didn't know that I needed soothing. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And and I, I love this. And the deeper I get into this journey myself, th this occurred to me like, a, for lack of a better way to phrase it, like a baseball bat to the face about eight months ago. Um, I was going through this another certification process, just learning, like, trying to understand what, what childhood trauma and abuse like truly is. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me, and, and I'm, I'm going to go somewhere with what you just said in, in parallel to this. You know, for me, when, when I was four years old, my mother cut off my right index finger. She was a drug addict and alcoholic. I was homeless as a kid. I stole food to survive. I don't have a high school education. My three childhood best friends got murdered. Like the list goes on and on and on. And what I realized, Dr. Ray, what I realized the actual truth about trauma and abuse is it's not, and, and, and this is, I want to have a parlay in a conversation with you to see how close I am in this. I don't believe it's those experiences that we carry. I think it's the theft of our identity. And the thing that we have to go through is this place of doing what I'm hearing you say, get into the place of being able to live in this brain 3.0, where we're actually living on our terms. Does that feel copacetic? It absolutely, you're, you're so on the money. You're so on the money because it is a loss of identity because when you're born, you're born pure, loving, joyful. And then these very, and again, it isn't, you know, to me, it, it, listen, from an adult perspective, the things you just described, I felt that viscerally in my body. I, fe I felt it, it hurt right? To listen to you talk about that. But that's an adult response. But as a child, a child, you had an emotional, like, disconnect all of a sudden from that joyful, you were up here in this joyful state as a child. And, and this happens. And what you actually picked up on is your emotions or somebody else's emotions, the pain, the pain that you felt and the unfairness and the lack of like, like that is, that is not a loving move on your mother's part, you know, to cut off your finger, like the disconnect from your true essence of who you are, because who you see yourself are is how you see other people as a child. You're a pure being, they're a pure being. And suddenly they're not being a pure being. They're being something that's not logic, not like, I don't want to say logic because you don't really have logic, but there's an emotion, there's such a huge emotional disconnect from this joyful, you're dropping down so much on the emotional vibrational scale to this place of fear and despair and all those things you must have felt at that time. That is the break in being. That is, that is, that is the loss of identity it is literally a fall from that grace from where emotionally you're on this higher plane to this sort of un unfamiliar to a baby. You have to understand fear and despair and, you know, just not lack of control. Those are so unfamiliar. That is not how, how you came into this world. Those are new feelings. And that's the part that's like, is that me? How can I feel this way kind of thing? Right? It's just unfamiliar new emotions that nobody explained why why you were feeling that. You just knew you didn't like it. How much of while you're in this journey of going through this process, evaluating, making meaning of these experiences, one of the things that I teach my clients early on is I'm like, you have to literally create yourself. There's in my first book, it, it's subtitled create you because there is this aspect of like, as you're understanding and overcoming trauma and abuse, like you're effectively, and this was my experience, like falling forward, right? Just yeah. constantly in this place. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a note as we were, we were speaking here and I, I thought to myself, can you, and how do you stay in brain 3.0? Yeah. Um, I wish I could just magically bring people into brain 3.0. I think you could, you know, the old, the old, old way is to go meditate somewhere for 10 years, you know, and take yourself out of society. Got the time. <laughs> right. But nobody's got that time. And that's where, why there's such a huge interest in these other alternative therapies that are emerging. And of course, I'm going to say rest is the most direct route 
to getting to brain 3.0. That is what we tell people is because, you know, by the time you've done, let's say, you know, each rest session is no, no more than 50 minutes. Sometimes they're even faster. Um, each time you start to break up these fundamental patterns that have been running your life in a way that you don't approve of, of yourself, you know, and when that happens is that I, I would say a person who's done like 20 rest sessions probably has broken up so much of the automatic behaviors that don't serve them that they are really, they have nowhere else to go but brain 3.0. They're just because their brain is clear. It just it it's an it's just like this natural evolution that happens when you let go of the stress patterns. Why do people revert behavioral patterns into things that, for lack of a better term, destroy their lives while they consciously know this thing that I'm doing is fucking my life up? Because as you said, it's an autonomic response. They're so not thinking anymore. Well, you know, you can, you have about when you, meditation is a daily practice that can help you start to recognize, kind of create a little distance from you and your thoughts, if you will. If you can kind of slow down your thoughts or start to focus your thoughts, maybe on one object, when you start to, when you start to realize you are not your thoughts, probably that's the first step, you know, like you are not your thoughts, you're having your thoughts. And so if you're having thoughts that aren't serving you, that are kind of what I call dead end thoughts, starting to recognize that. But it's hard to do that unless you recognize you have control in the first place. And that's why, you know, so many people recommend meditation. It's because that's like the first step towards controlling your thoughts from running away with you, running away from you, right? Like you're actually just, okay, I am just going to, for the next 20 minutes, focus on, doesn't matter what it is, this pen. What am I doing? I'm focusing my thoughts. I start thinking about something else. I bring my focus back to the pen. Just stare at the pen and breathe. Breathe and look at the pen. So what you're doing is you're gaining that muscle memory, brain muscle memory of focus. And you start to realize, aha, I can focus my thoughts. I have control over my thoughts. Because so many people run around and their thoughts are their reality. They, they don't think outside of their thoughts, if you will. Like they don't realize there could be other thoughts that may be just as useful or it may be more useful than what they're thinking. So meditation is definitely something I would recommend for everyone. Um, that is even just starting the day. I think in the morning is when you have the greatest control, meditation and then intention the intention to literally be present and the and breath breath connects you when so we can breathe unconsciously which is what most people do all day long or as soon as you bring your focus and your attention to your breath you start to combine conscious and subconscious mind together and subconscious mind is also connected to the body subconscious mind also controls the body it, it, it's much more than just what's in your brain when you start to focus on your breath, many things happen physiologically. You can start to breathe deeper. If you breathe into your diaphragm, which is like below your lungs, if you start to breathe down into your diaphragm instead of up in here, then you, again, you stimulate that vagus nerve. You start to calm down your heart rate variability and you start to send all the good signals to your brain. So if you could stay in that state of being conscious of your brain, of your of your heart, your joy and appreciation, heart math. They, they recommend those meditations where you're actually spending 10, 15 minutes. You know, you could stare at a, you can do something simple like stare at a pen, or you could spend 15 minutes like closing your eyes, focusing on your breath. As soon as you start to focus on your breath, you're in this, you're in this sort of self hypnotic state where you're both aware and starting to connect with your subconscious mind. Okay. And then what you can do then is start to focus on something that's easy to love and appreciate, like just for a few minutes, like maybe a pet or a scene in nature, something that you don't have to struggle with yourself to, to bring up that emotion of joy and appreciation. Right. And when you do that, 
you start to teach yourself, you start to build those circuits, because those are circuits too, of how to manage your heart rate variability. So those are daily practices. However, all of us have these like really strong patterns from childhood, and that's where rest comes in. And I, you know, I think meditation can get you there, but it'll probably take 10 years of your life of meditating to get there, lots of work, or you could do some rest sessions and accelerate the process. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I did a little bit of a self study research, <laughs> uh, deep dive over the course of the last month. Mm -hmm. And what I decided to do was not meditate. Mm. I said, I'm not going to meditate at all. I've been doing it for years. Meditation, yoga, part of my daily, weekly routine for over a decade now. Mm -hmm. And I said this month, April, I'm not going to do it. No meditation, April. And I can tell you right now, as of like three days ago, I was meditating again. <laughs> didn't even make it because you <laughs> didn't make it because it felt life felt chaotic. Yes. Right. Yes. You, you talk about I love that you use the word control. Mm -hmm. I want people to like sit in that word for a moment because people who come from traumatic backgrounds, you know, one of the things I, I absolutely fucking hate is when people are like, I thrive in chaos. Yes. Like, you, <laughs> you do to. not thrive in chaos. You don't. And I used to be that guy. I used to like, I thrive in chaos. This is my favorite place to be. No, it's nonsense. That is the worst place to thrive. Like that is the most triggered and hyper vigilant and chaotic cortisol induced place you could be. And that's where I felt myself ebbing back into. And it was, I was thinking about this. I was like, oh, wow, hold on. I don't normally ever do that thing that I just did. Mm -hmm. There's something weird here. And I remembered being like, I'm not going to meditate. And I go, oh, there's <laughs> truth in the power of this. Because I just done it for so long, it became habitual. Mm -hmm. And to remove it, like I felt the ramification. And so like, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of this. You know, I, I feel like we're just starting to get into this conversation. We could go so much longer. Um, but one thing I want to touch base on before I ask you my last question is I want to talk about that correlation between that brain health and the physical health. I just want to come full circle there. You know, we kind of started there. We looked at your journey, we looked at your, you being sick. There are people listening. I know right now who are like, man, my body is just, ugh. I don't feel like I'm going to make it till tomorrow. What, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, that is that chronic stress. Again, that meditation that you do, what that's doing is creating the right chemical milieu in your body and in your brain to self-regulate all the cells and tissues and organs of the body. The cells and tissues and organs of your body are highly intelligent, but they need the right signals, the right chemicals, the right biochemistry happening. And that cannot happen when you're triggered and stressed. Because like in order to look, here's the thing. And this is how stress used to be explained. Um, I went to Stanford where I met Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who wrote the famous book, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Well, why don't they get ulcers? Well, because if a zebra is being chased by a lion, He's in flight or fight mode, right? He's going to fly. His, his only choice probably is to flight because he's not going to fight with the, with the lion. So the zebra is running for his life. And then let's say he narrowly escapes. He's either going to become lunch and it's over or he narrowly escapes. What does the zebra do when he narrowly, right after he narrowly escapes? He shakes it off. He changes his physiological state. What is he doing? He's shaking off all that nasty chemistry from the autonomic nervous system, sending so much cortisol to his legs so he can run like a maniac, you know, away from the lion. But if in order to send all that cortisol into the body and get the legs to move and everything that has to happen, you have to stop digestion. You have to stop you know, normal regulation and maintenance of the body, your immune system has to shut off, you're not going to be fighting any viruses while you're running away from the lion. So you literally shut everything off. But that whole episode is not going to last more than a few minutes, either the either he's going to be lunch, or he's going to get away, and then he's going to shake it off. 
we are being chased by the lion of mortgage payments and jobs and stressful, you know, and like guilt of not eating right and not exercising and, and or ex over exercising or whatever people yelling at us trying to raise kids. That lion is chasing us all the time. And our immune system is off the whole time. Our digestion is off the whole time. Everything is off. And you're also not running and you're also not shaking it off either, right? So we've, we've lost our mechanisms for control, as you said, during that. So we're experiencing chronic stress and we, are, we were never meant to live in a chronically stressed state. The, our physiology just cannot handle it. It can only do it for minutes at a time. If we were truly being chased by lions, that would be one thing. But when the lion is on your back all day long, you, it's going to affect your health because you can't self-regulate. You're, you're not, you know, in homeostasis. You don't have a chance to get, bring that balance back between your autonomic, your, 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 your autonomic nervous system has two sides, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is that kind of flight or fight or go, go, go time. The sympathetic system actually gets you out of bed in the morning, which is good. It, it You need it to get going in the morning. You do secrete a little bit of cortisol to get up in the morning and get going. And that cortisol pulse in the morning is very necessary. However, you don't want that overstimulation of cortisol. You don't want that sympathetic system going strong all day long. You also need the parasympathetic system to slow things down so you can rest and digest. So if we're in, being chased by the lion all the time, your sympathetic system is up here and your parasympathetic system is down here. Meditation, especially this heart rate variability, um, you know, meditation I was talking about where you focus on something you enjoy and appreciate, that brings you joy and appreciation, can bring that balance back to your autonomic nervous system. And when you have that again, now your body can get into homeostasis, it can digest your food, you can you know, repair, you can have your immune system working again, everything's back online. Yeah. And, and that's why I always remind the listeners, the amazing unbroken nation to think about parachute. You have to rescue yourself when you are in your sympathetic and make sure you pull that freaking wire to get into your parasympathetic nervous system back into rest and digest back into a place of homeostasis. Probably the greatest thing that I've ever done in my life is recognize like sometimes you got to pull that rip cord, you know, yeah. um, Dr. Ray, this conversation has been absolutely incredible. Before I ask you my last question, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Yes. Uh, our website is rest.com. That's with two R's. And in fact, I have a gift for your listeners. Um, there is a beautiful meditation we're offering to people on their self-worth, which might have been something that happened to you at a child, as a child that affected how you, you know, your self-confidence, your self-worth, how you feel, what you think about yourself most of the time. And it's a healing meditation and you can download it by going to rest.com with two R's, R-R-E-S-T.com forward slash self-worth. So please download that beautiful meditation. And if you do it every day, again, it's another thing you can do to focus your mind, bring yourself into hip, a hypnotic state that can help you bring your autonomic nervous system back into balance, as well as start to heal. The other way to start to affect the subconscious mind is through repetition. So if you can you know, do that meditation daily for about 30 days, you will see that it has a great impact on how you see yourself when you look in the mirror. So that's just a gift that I wanted to offer your listeners. Beautiful. And thank you for that. And of course, we'll put the link in the show notes for the Unbroken Nation. My last question for you, my friend, what does it mean to you to be unbroken? I love who I am. I can truly own, you know, when you can own the beauty of who you are, then you start to see other people as beautiful beings too. But it starts with like, if you can be kind to yourself, if you can be generous with yourself, if you can appreciate that if you are doing something that doesn't see, feel right to you, instead of feeling shame and guilt, really look and, and understand at least that this is just a behavior that's being triggered by your childhood and it's fine and it's okay. And so 
when you become unbroken, then you realize you were never broken to begin with, right? You, you were born this beautiful, pure being. And when you start to experience yourself from this place, then you can love and appreciate other humans in this same way and naturally have empathy and sympathy and also be okay with your emotions. Like we're supposed to be emotional. We're supposed to have emotional responses. That doesn't mean we have to, our, our world doesn't have to have fall apart because somebody died and we have to go through grief. You know, we, we're allowed to feel emotions without the emotions taking over our physiology. That's what it means to me to be unbroken is to be, you know, our, our tagline at rest is emotions matter, master yours. That's what it means to be unbroken. Somebody who is in, has emotional mastery. Beautifully said, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Beautiful. Thank you.